my favorite protein source is probably either like over easy eggs that are runny with cheese on top, a Parmesan cheese, Parmigiano Reggiano, or a ground beef or a ground boar cooked in butter, like medium rare or like more on the rare side. Is this is a patty? Yeah, kind of like a patty. Yeah, not like all ground up, but like a patty that's been basted in butter and is on the rarer side. Yeah, it's actually what I'm working on right now. So that is like my glutes and my hips, they get tighter than most areas. Um, and historically it used to be my hip flexors. So I did a lot of work on opening up my hip flexors, couch stretch, uh, reverse Nordic, or uh, I guess you call it like a seal pose. No, not seal pose, um, saddle pose. Um, but I kind of over, not overdid it, but I, I worked so hard on that that like my glutes and uh, this, the, the glutes kind of are the key to unlocking my hamstrings, but that part is a little bit under uh, appreciated in my, uh, my mobility. So I'm working on that a lot this year. Um, and this is one of the best stretches that I have found uh, to really get into the pigeon pose. So the pigeon pose, great way to unlock those glutes, but I find it to be so hard to do on the ground. Um, putting my leg up on a box doesn't feel good, but putting it on an incline bench like this, has been game changer. Thank you, Ben Patrick, for that tutorial. Um, great question. How many rest days do I take? Well, for the, the last half of 2021, uh, which was about six months, maybe five months, I took zero rest days. Now, let me qualify that. A rest day could have meant just doing cardio uh, and no weights, um, or sorry, one of those training days. But four or five days a week, I would lift weights, and then every day, I did cardio. And I'm keeping that up. Um, but towards the end of the year, I was starting to mix in cardio workouts that had dumbbells in it and had you know lots of push-ups and toes to bar and ghd sit-ups and essentially what i found which is what a lot of people have to experience themselves is that when you do too many contractions in a week you start to get into just a fatigue state and you're not recovering and you're not seeing your performance imp improve and you're really just tired um so i was just working out to work out which isn't a problem it's just not training for progression it was exercising for the love of exercising and moving. And I was trying to progress other areas of my life. But I realized at the turn of the year, I was in some cases overtrained and just moving too much um, to see measurable progress in lifts or measurable progress in my performance or in my muscle mass if I wanted to improve muscle mass. So this year I am taking, I'm being more strategic about this two days a week um, as I encourage people to do and uh, persist, I'm really dialing back my movement and my exercise. On those two days, I will only do cardio workouts that are um, just monostructural, low impact, easy biking, skiing, and rowing, nothing intense. So uh, I'll even turn some of those days into walks or hikes. So they will not be impactful, they'll be more blood flow, recovery focus and spending a lot more time on that day, getting outside, maybe trying to take some hikes, get into nature, do some more mobility, and just really focus on blood flow. So that's usually Thursday and Sunday for me. I haven't really spoken it out loud. Um, I do want to work and progress a bit more towards the front split. Um, I'm not gonna say that 2022 is the year that I have to get the front split. However, there have been additions to the persist training track, um, the warm ups, the cool downs, and the active recovery day mobility follow along videos 
many of which are guided towards improving mobility for those for that specific uh, you know flexibility metric and I'm going to be following those I'm going to be implementing them a couple times a week and really seeing how does improving the flexibility in the hip flexors and the hamstrings those are the two big areas for me that would be a limiter for the front split how would that translate to just better overall performance health and just uh, you know well-being and then from a performance standpoint, I, I want to get back to um, Olympic lifting and getting back to some numbers in my Olympic lifts um, that are not going to be anywhere near my maxes, but you know, I'd like to snatch 225 again. Um, I'd like to clean 315, uh, clean and jerk 315 would be amazing. Um, and then really see if I can push my back squat, my deadlift up, you know, to numbers that I used to do routinely, but would feel like, you know, PRs. I haven't, I haven't deadlifted above 400 pounds very much in the last two years. I have not back squatted above 300 pounds very much in the last two years. So I'd like to get into a habit where I'm routinely doing that, you know, a few, a couple to a few times a month. Um, and if I'm feeling good halfway through the year, then see if I can set, you know, a personal goal to push my power lifts uh, even higher. Oh, my favorite cardio machine. I, it's hard to pick. Um, what I do tell people, I'll give you three different scenarios. Number one, when somebody asks me, what's, if I could get one cardio machine, what should I get? I typically will tell them to get a rowing machine or one of the, you know, arm crank bicycles that is out there. I usually say rower first just because I think it provides the greatest full body stimulus if you're just gonna have one machine. I'm fortunate enough to have all the machines or just about all of the machines. And so on a day where I'm trying to, um, you know, th then I, at that point I go to, what's the difference between the bike and the ski machine? The ski machine is just so unique. You cannot replicate it any other way. People ask, hey, what should I do if I don't have a ski? I say, you know, you're gonna have to pick something else that's not gonna give you the same stimulus. The ski machine is so uh, such a great complement in the gym because it is so upper body dominant and it gives your lower body more or less a rest and you can pair it with things that you might otherwise not be able to pair you know, a bike or a rower so easily with because they don't complement each other very well. So I love the ski um, and it certainly packs a punch but it also builds great upper body you know, muscle endurance too. And then the biker is sort of like um, even on a day where I'm feeling tired or my legs are sore, I can always find a workout or something on the bike erg where I can sustain good aerobic output. So I think the bike erg is a terrific machine uh, to have in the toolbox if you you know are looking to add in more steady state cardio. It doesn't per it doesn't give you the big full body impact like an assault bike or an echo bike would. So if you're looking for something for high intensity, the biker is not the best choice in my opinion. That would be more rowing or the echo assault bike. I have lately loved programming a lot of variations, um, specifically dumbbell variations of the bench press. Um, my shoulder has been feeling good the last few months and really good lately with dumbbell bench pressing, which historically has given me some problems. So when it's feeling good, I'm just very excited to do it. Uh, I think dumbbell bench pressing in particular is such a great shoulder, chest, tricep developer and just great for movement patterning. And I think that it needs to show up in more people's programs. I don't think group fitness programs use the dumbbell bench press a lot because there's not enough benches, not enough dumbbells. We love to use it in functional bodybuilding. I think it's so important that it shows up regularly. I think that unilateral stability uh, challenge of using dumbbells, especially if you mix it into fatigued workouts, is terrific. So I like to go heavy with it, but I also like to mix it in with ski erg, or I like to do it in a functional pump conditioning workout. That's been super fun lately. Um, I've also gone, you know, I've, I've I have, uh, added in a lot of core flexion. So lots of toes to bars, knees to elbows, and GHD sit-ups. 
Um, I have worked hard to build up a tolerance and a resilience to those movements. Um, and now I like to use them, you know, two or three times a week in my, uh, in, in my programming and in the programs in general, but I need to be mindful that not everybody has a huge resilience in those exercises that can create a lot of muscle damage and soreness in the abdominals. So I always pair that stuff back and make sure that we're not doing too much and persist, but dumbbell bench pressing and toes to bar or GHD sit-ups have been some movements that I just really, uh, I've really enjoyed lately a lot. Oh man, you want like the perfect soft boiled egg, I think would be, you know, it's the, the things you want to learn how to cook perfectly are the things that you almost don't know if they're perfect until you take them out and you cut into them. And then once they're cut into, you can't go and fix it. So a soft boiled egg, once you crack it, once you cut through it, is the yolk the perfect temperature? That's something you can't take back. <laughs> the other one is, you know, like a, a really good steak. It's like once you, you want to get the right sear on it, you want to get the right temperature throughout, you want it to be evenly cooked from front to back, side to side. Uh, you know, when it's time to go and cut into your meat, you cut in. If it's underdone or if it's overdone, it's like putting it back on the fire is not going to, it's not going to end well because you've already lost a lot of like you know, moisture, flavor, juices from inside. And if it's overdone, you can't take that back. So those would be kind of the two that are high on my list. I'm trying to get outside every single day, uh, no matter how cold, how rainy uh, it feels, um, and just get out of my, you know, climate controlled office, bedroom, kitchen, gym. Um, and so the other day at the gym, I like opened the, opened the roll up doors, even though it was chilly. I put my bike right in front, you know, right at the, right at the door, the sun was coming in, you know, that was, uh, that was, that was an attempt to try and get connected with outside. I think so many people suffer from wintertime blues or seasonal affective disorder or some type of like decreased energy, decreased mood, uh, depressed state in the winter months. And I would, you know, it, it's not just because it's darker, it's because not we're, we're, it's darker so the days are shorter, less sunlight, but then when there is sunlight or when there is any UV rays outside or there's any opportunity to get outside with some light, people are staying indoors because it's cold. And so like the more we sequester inside, the more we, you know, crank up the heat on our uh, furnace, the more we layer up and we protect our body from feeling nature, the, uh, the greater the likelihood that we're gonna feel depressed, we're gonna feel a dip in energy, we're gonna see a, a decrease in our metabolism. And so it's, it's, there's nothing about it that feels comfortable for most people. And if you live in harsh climates, it's not gonna be fun, but you still gotta go do it. And um, anyway, that's my goal.